welcome to the Jesus Radio. Our God is an all-consuming fire. Be transformed by the power of Christianity is not a weekly thing, it's not an hourly thing, it is a second thing. Well, <laughs> greetings. Welcome to the Jesus Radio Show. Welcome to the Jesus Radio Show. I'm Jim, and this is Phil. Hey. And uh, we're here to, to serve you today, to serve God first and foremost. I was talking to a brother, uh, and we were talking about, uh, he was talking about trying to serve other people first. Or he was just talking about serving other people, and, and I, and I, and I kind of warned him, and I said, you know, if we if we go to if we go to serve other people and make other people um f- feel good and et cetera et cetera without uh repairing without allowing God to repair our relationship with him then w- we run the risk of replacing the first commandment with the second one and the first and the greatest commandment and the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So, uh, anyway, praise God. Tidbit before uh, Michael Baldia calls. Or, actually, let's let's just give him a call um, and see what happens. Praise God. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, let him. Oh. Uh, I guess that's him. Yeah, that's him. All right. <laughs> Phone is on. Hello? Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm supposed to be on a radio program in, uh, I guess, 15 minutes. Yeah, this is it. Um, praise God, this is Jim. Hey, Jim, this is Mike. Okay, you're actually on the air right now. Oh, wow. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So, um, that's okay, though. All right, um, wait, let's take you off the air for just a second. Okay. How's it going? All right, cool. Well, Jim's on the phone with okay, with uh, Michael Boldea, okay, um, grandson of Dimitri Dudeman, who uh, I heard of through Jim. Uh, he's a was a Romanian missionary uh, under communism, and uh, smuggled Bibles around the country and yeah. was persecuted for the for the cause for the cross. Yeah. And uh, so this is going to be uh, an interesting show. We've never had a uh, never had a, a a guest speaker on. But, uh, and I'm not really sure what I'm going to say right now because I'm just waiting for Jim to <laughs> to get ready. So I'm going to open my Bible and find something nice to read. All right. Well, praise God. Thanks that you that you called in. Let's see here. What do y'all want to hear? Uh, up something something short. <laughs> All right, this. Never mind. Here here comes here comes Mike. Come back on the air. All right. <laughs> um, go for it. All right, Mike, you're on the air. Uh, good to be with you. Okay, so my name is Jim and. This is Mike. <laughs> and so, anyway, um, so Mike, let's see. I guess the first thing we want to say is, um, so tell us about yourself. Uh, who, who's your grandfather? Well, uh, my grandfather was uh, a man that I guess is, is is known in the U.S. in certain circles. His name was Demetri Dudeman. Uh, I, I come from a family of Bible smugglers, and that is my uh, stellar past. So my grandpa was a Bible smuggler in Romania, and... Um, he got caught, not with Bibles, but, uh, you know, people told on him because it was the way communism worked. And so he went through some torture and some persecution. Uh, and eventually we were uh, kicked out of our country and came to the U.S. in 1984. And uh, my grandfather had been a pastor in Romania. And uh, when we came here, you know, we, we expected to find uh, God's heaven on earth. I mean, all the Bibles came from, from America. 
uh, we thought we would find a level of spirituality, you know, unlike any other in the world. Uh, we were, uh, in fact, uh, sorely mistaken. Uh, it was during that time when we first arrived to this country that my grandfather had a revelation that uh, this nation would be judged uh, if it did not repent. And uh, I know that back when he received this, uh, it was very difficult for people to believe that a nation like America could fall under judgment or that we could be, you know, pray for someone. But in the last few years, uh, you know, we've seen uh, more and more people realize that only God's protection has kept us. Uh, and uh, when we disobey God so blatantly, when we reject Him uh, and the principles that are set forth in the Word of God, we can't at the same time expect His protection. So uh, I believe, like so many are beginning to believe, that judgment is coming upon a land that has refused to acknowledge God. Hmm. Yeah, I remember, um, you know, you talking before about, you know, every, just every nation that, you know, rebels against God. You know, God basically judges that nation. Well, not only that, we we have to realize that, you know, uh, you guys are like a college program, so I'm sure that, yeah. you know, there's a lot of history majors. Uh, you know, if, if you study every great empire that has been, uh, every civilization that, that, you know, left a mark uh, on, on the history of the world, right before their fall, right before they turned into nothing more than dust and ash, uh, they were at the peak of their sin and immorality. You go to the Romans, to the Greeks, to the Egyptians, and, and it's all the same thread. Uh, you know, people were, were exceedingly evil, and uh, in an instant, you know, it was like the lights getting shut off. Uh, it, it crumbled and it fell. Uh, they're, they're, you know, I believe in God. I believe that Christ is the Son of God, and only through Him we have salvation. And my faith compels me to believe that God cannot overlook sin. And so sin must be judged. It's, it's the law of cause and effect. You know, God doesn't take pleasure in judging people. He doesn't take pleasure in punishing a nation. But his righteousness demands that he does. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, okay, so, you know, I, you know I've, I've passed a few, a few tracks Hello? here. Are you there? Hello? Are you there? Hello? Hello? Mike? Hello? Hello? Mike? Can you hear? Hello? <laughs> hey, Mike? Uh, I can't hear. I'm sorry. I, I heard Mike, but that's about it. Okay, Mike, are you there? Yes. Yes, I am now. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, I don't know what happened. That's all right. All right. Um, okay. So, oh, you must have heard it through the microphone. No, I don't know. Okay. Anyway. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I, I've told a, you know a few of my, or should I say, classmates on on my campus, and it's kind of a hard message to hear that, that you know, America is going to be judged, especially, you know, a lot of college students that are, you know, that you know they're just thinking about careers and money and stuff like that well i'm i'm still relatively young you know i i still have uh what would be deemed aspirations and i still have a future to look forward to but you know sometimes uh, reality is inconvenient the truth is inconvenient uh and uh we can choose to acknowledge the truth of of the society we're living in and the times we're living in or turn our back uh, i think every man is is left up with that choice and if we look into our hearts and if we look at this world uh... you know not not from a patriotic sense not from an american sense uh... but just simply as 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 a you know neutral observer we can see where we're headed you know i only people who choose ignorance are ignorant of the times that we're living in right now mm. uh... and knowing the times that we're living in the only question that remains is what sort of men ought we to be you know what sort of christians ought we to be I think uh, the message is, is more potent for Christians than for non-Christians, because, you know, we're living in a society where half-hearted commitment and half-hearted Christianity is an accepted way of life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, any, any philosophy majors that you have, I'm sure have heard of a guy named Soren Kierkegaard. He was a Danish philosopher. 
Uh, and he put forth the idea that if you're going to serve God, it's an either-or proposition. You know, you're either with God or against Him. We, we can't have duplicity in our hearts. We can't attempt to serve the world and as- attempt to serve God at the same time. I think many men have fallen because they've tried to reconcile the world uh, with God and God with the world, and it's an impossible venture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things we, we've been talking about is, you know, if there are 10,000 lukewarm Christians, you know, just one Christian's gonna going to be able to stand, you know, versus 10,000 lukewarm who will all be, I guess, spewed out of Christ's mouth. Well, you know, there, there's that old saying, I would rather have one gold coin than a thousand copper ones. Uh, you know, God would rather have uh, one truly committed servant uh, than a thousand that only pay him lip service. Uh, I, I think that, you know, there are too many lukewarm Christians, and this is why we don't see the effective change in this nation, in, in the moral structure, uh, in the social structure. You know, right now we're saying, you know, we're, we're at the peak of, of percentage Christian-wise, but you know, the morality is being eroded all that much faster, and so we can't reconcile the two. If Christianity is is experiencing a growth spurt, then so should morality. Oh, yeah. Yeah, amen. Amen. Right, okay, so, um, so your, your grandfather, uh, Dimitri... Hello? Hello? Your grandfather. Can you hear me? Hello? What? I can't hear. Uh, hello? So do what you did before. It worked. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes. You I can hear, can hear me now. you now. Yes. Okay, I have no idea what's going on. They said the phone ha- was having problems. So. Uh-huh. All right, anyway, praise God. So you said your your grandfather was... Or your grandfather is uh, Dimitri, Dimitri Dudemon. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. And he comes to America, basically, and he says that America is Mystery Babylon. Exactly. Is that correct? Okay, so, so why, why is America Mystery Babylon? And I've certainly read up on what you're talking about. Okay, well, uh, we have to realize that when John the Revelator received uh, you know, what would become the Book of Revelation, uh, when God spoke of... Babylon, the Babylon of old was already destroyed. Now, I can, I can point, you know, at least two dozen similarities between the Babylon that is described in Revelation 18 uh, and the Babylon that is described in Jeremiah chapter 51 mm-hmm. uh, to, to the U.S. today. Uh, I think that God sees the future as well as, as well as he sees the present. And it would have been you know, uh, short-sighted of God not to mention a nation as great as America and warn it uh, uh, concerning, you know, its inevitable fall if it didn't repent. You know, Revelation 18 speaks of a nation that is rich beyond any other, uh, with whom all the merchants of the earth make merchandise with her. She says she sits as a queen. Uh, Jeremiah 51 speaks of a nation that is surrounded by great waters, uh, there, there's a lot of similarities in the Word of God between those scriptures and, and, and what the U.S. is today. But I think even with that aside, uh, we, we can agree to disagree concerning whether America is in scripture or not. Uh, we can still see where it's headed. You don't need prophetic utterance today to realize what's going to happen tomorrow. I think we're surrounded on all sides by enemies, and I think that uh, we've trusted in ourselves and think ourselves to be great for so long that we dismiss the idea of God's protection, God will show us how truly impotent man is, if not for him. You know, we've not seen the true measure of our impotence yet, but I think we will shortly. Okay. Yeah, so I, I guess everyone's, you know, wondering, well, how shortly? <laughs> what do you say to that? What do I say to that? I, I, I say, you know, look at the fig tree. That's what, that's what Jesus said to those who were questioning uh, the timetable. He said, look at the fig tree. If you see that it's blooming, you know there's, there's going to be fruit soon. Uh, I think that we can look at the, the current climate of this nation and realize that we are at door's judgment. Uh, I'm not going to give months or years, but I think uh, definitely within our lifetime. So it's something we need to prepare for spiritually. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, 
Um, okay, and so, so like, you know, you, you preach in churches pretty much every yes. Sunday, right? Uh, I am on the road about nine months out of the year, so I, I'm pretty much always gone, yeah. Okay, so, so why do you do what you do? I mean, what has God shown you, you know? I, I do what I do in the hopes of delaying the inevitable. I think that's the best way I can describe what I do. I do what I do because I have a love for people. And I think uh, a lot of doctrine today mistakes uh, sentimentality for true conversion. You know, and we need to have that, that experience with God, and not just experience, but continual fellowship with God. I do what I do because so few have truly tasted of the goodness of God, because so true have, have, have seen what true salvation is. And uh, I do my part. I, I preach the truth of God's Word. I preach repentance, which is uh, the key to unlocking, uh, you know, God in our hearts. And I think that uh, right now, those that know should weep for those who live in a dream, uh, who are dying in darkness and, and just plunging into despair. There's so many people out there that are trying to find surrogates, uh, that are trying to find uh, something to take the place of God, and it's an impossible feat. Uh, and even in churches, there are people that are going that, you know, have been caught up in the whole prosperity ideology or the whole self-help doctrine ideology, and they see how, how flawed these things are. Uh, Christ is the only way. If, you, if there were any other way than Christ, then Christ's death would have been in vain. So I preach Christ. I preach salvation through Christ, and I do what I do because it is a calling. Uh, believe me when I tell you that I don't do it for my health. I don't do it because I like to stand up in front of people. Um, I'm actually very introverted. I'm, I'm basically a shut-in when I'm home. I just sit and read and write. So uh, it, it, it takes a lot for me to get up in front of a group of people. Uh, but when I'm there, I know that I'm in God's will. I know that I'm doing what God requires of me, and, and it's, it's the perfect place to be. Amen. 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 Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and so, so what do you think about churches? You know, I, I wonder, is, it, is, it really, is there another message that can be preached besides repentance? I can't hear you again. Can't hear me again? All right. Hello? 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 I can't hear you. Hello? I can hear you now. Okay, you can hear me now. <laughs> oh, man. <That's> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, well, praise God you can hear me now. So. <laughs> yeah, it's um, a, a, a Verizon at its best, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, so do you think, do you think uh, you know, church, churches today can, can preach another message besides repentance? I think they are doing it, and, and we've seen the result of it. Uh, it's, it's taken a few years, but we're seeing the facade crumbling. Look, we can't... I, I, I think it's, it's the worst disservice to a new Christian or somebody trying to find God to put on an air of hypocrisy and, and, and put on this image of what we're not. You know, Christ looked upon the Pharisees and he called them whitewashed tombs, uh, you know, in which rested dead men's bones and, and, and were filled with uncleanness. Uh, you know, there, there's this pervasive ideology in the church that, yeah, we know there's sin and sin abounds, but we're going to try to shelter the people that come to church from the idea that there's sin here. Look, we, we need to, you know, expose what is wrong and fix it. We need to remedy the situation if the church hopes to be that which God intended it to be. You know, we'll only realize what sin has made of the church when we recognize what God intended the church to be. You know, you were talking about you know, quality versus quantity. Christ took 12 men, you know, 10 of whom were, were uneducated, other than Luke and Paul. Uh, they were pretty simple people. Yet 12 men changed the world because they were committed and because they knew their God. They knew the will of their God, and they walked in the authority and the power of Christ. Uh, we need that again. We need, we need a reformation of the Church today just as bad as they did in the 1600s, I believe. So uh, this, this is where I'm at. This is my struggle. Uh, and it's not easy, because there's too many people that are content uh, with passive Christianity. There's too many Christians that are content if, if there's enough food on the table and there's a little money in the bank account, they no longer care about God. But the day is coming uh, when we will need to be dependent on God. You know, uh, 
flowers bloom in the summer, but only certain species of, of plant life can uh, withstand the winter. Right now, Christendom is, is in the summer. It's blooming. But winter is coming, and only then will we see the difference between, you know, the just and the unjust, the wheat and the tares, the righteous and the unrighteous, and we can go on with the cliches forever, but the truth of the matter is, uh, God knows my heart, and He knows your heart, and He knows the intent of our heart. And if our intent and our desire is for the stuff that God can give us, rather than for God Himself, we've missed the mark. And we're never going to know the true beauty of God unless we begin to pursue Him, and not just stuff from Him. Wow. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, um, so I mean, you know, so one question I, I've always wanted to ask you is, you know, what is it? What is what does it mean to be holy to you? Like, what does it mean? What is it? What does it look like? What What does holiness look like? Holiness is striving against sin and resisting temptation. Uh, the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and he gets back up. It, it doesn't mean he falls into sin, but, but he stumbles into the snares the devil sets before him. He is, however, wise enough to resist the sin, to resist temptation, to fight, to struggle, uh, you know, to maintain himself pure in the way of the gospel, in, in, in the way of, of the teachings of Christ. You know, we so readily give in to sin because uh, our, our foundation is in the wrong place. You know, we're being taught that, you know, if you can think it, you can be it, uh, and, you know, if, if you say a certain mantra, you can overcome anything. But the truth of the matter is, as long as we're still flesh, as long as we're trusting in ourselves rather than in Christ, we will fall. We will bend and we will break. There is Peter in the Bible who Christ called the rock. And, and I'm looking at Peter right before he denied Christ, standing there and going, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison and even to death with you. I mean, this guy believed that he was ready. In his mind, he believed that he was ready. Peter wasn't lying, I don't believe. Peter wasn't just trying to impress Christ by, by showing how faithful he was. I think he truly believed it when he said, I'm ready to go to prison and even to death. But when the time came, his own flesh betrayed him, because Peter had not been born again. He had not been consecrated unto God. He had not been sanctified. Peter was still trusting in his flesh rather than in Christ. I think as long as we trust in the flesh, we will have failure after failure and defeat after defeat as Christians. When we trust in Christ, you know, we become renewed. We are born again, and we adopt the mentality of Paul. For me, to, to, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And if our walk is that every day, to know that He is our priority and nothing else matters, we will be able to overcome. You know, there's an old saying, the devil's job is to tempt, ours is to resist. So... Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so so what do you say to those who, like, you know, they, they fight, they fight, they fight, but then they fall? And then then they fight, they fight, but then they fall into sin. Get up and fight again. I, look, the, the Bible is very clear. I, I think that people that are continually backsliding, uh, I, I liken it to people who start a race and they like to hear the sound of the starter pistol, so they return back to the starting line. Look, uh, go deeper in God. You know, have a more intimate relationship with Him. Don't leave God on the outskirts of your existence. Make Him the nucleus, the center of your existence. And if you realize the beauty of God, and, and if, you, if you just touch the grace of God once, you, you will know what it is to be righteous and holy, and you will not desire other things. I don't believe that anyone that's truly had an experience with God that has truly seen God at work, that God has revealed himself into their heart, you know, so often stumble. I, I, I think, you know, there's a reverence there for those that truly know God, and they turn away from evil, they repent, they run away from it, they don't put themselves in positions where, you know, well, Lord, I, I'm in my kitchen and I set my house on fire, come and save me. You know, I, I think that's an infantile train of thought. I think that our job is to resist, to turn away. If we know that something tempts us, 
if we know that this is our weakness, then we stay away from it. And every time it, it, it springs up, we go to the Word, and we go to prayer, and we plead the blood of Christ, because He is able to sustain us. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we, uh, we talk to college students all the time, and it, we pretty much, I mean, I, I personally, I, I, I hear the same thing. And but see, you know, ask any old person, and, and there's one answer they'll never give you. Mm-hmm. And that answer is, you know, I'm happy I squandered my youth. I, I think a lot of young people today have the mentality that, you know, Christianity, were at least religion, is, uh, you know, for the dying or soon to be dying. Uh, it, it's for the old people that, you know, have lived their lives. You know, there's nothing more beautiful than spending your youth with God. Uh, by the time you reach maturity, you'll realize just how precious that is, and you'll grow in knowledge that much more. Uh, I, I know people in my own church in Romania that, that have gone off to seminary, that have gone off to, to pursue biblical study, and they're 17, 18, 19. And, you know, I meet with them every time I go back to Romania, and none of them has any regrets. They say, God has revealed himself to me in such a way that, you know, if I could have, I would have done it sooner. So, you know, there is a reward for obedience. There is a reward for pursuing God, and the reward for pursuing God is that God allows himself to be found. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Um... Okay, so I also got a, a couple of questions from some other guys, and Shoot. so okay, so this guy, okay, so Greg asks, he says, "Is the test of a true prophet that all of his prophecies come true?" That's what the Bible says. Yes, but I I need to specify something because of the age that we're living in. Mm-hmm. Today, there's a lot of people that call themselves prophets that make educated ge- guesses. Mm-hmm. All right. And so, when their educated guess comes to pass, it's, it's within a day or two of them having said it. You know, when Jeremiah and Isaiah prophesied of the birth of Christ, they weren't standing outside a manger hearing a woman in birth pains and going, A child shall be born. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. When God gives a word, he does so far enough in advance where what he speaks seems almost impossible, if not improbable. You know, I I believe that the words that my grandfather had are for the end times. I believe that we're living in the end times, and we're seeing the fruition of these things. Uh, And so I'm I'm not defending my grandfather by any means, but I see the validity of what he said coming to pass. I see that God was there, because honestly, I have enough of a life, and I think I'm intelligent enough to pursue another career or to do something else if I knew that, what what had been said was a lie. I believe this is the truth. This is what I do. This is why I do what I do. And I could find easier ways of of feeding my family, and uh, I could I could probably spend less time doing it. But because I believe that the message is biblical, because I believe that the message is scriptural, and because it is coming to pass shortly, I do what I do. Okay. Next question. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So. Um... So then, then he asks again, he says, okay, it is our vocation as Christians to live a life of repentance, eliminating the sinful desires that lead us to sin and becoming more like Christ, holy, pure, and blameless, so we can be ready to meet Christ on Judgment Day. So then he says, well, why is it, in, therefore, why is it important to know in precise details what will happen to America or any other country or part of the world if our ro- vocation remains the same? Well, first of all, I, I, I think sometimes people misinterpret what the word repent means. The word repent means turn away. Uh, I I think God loved David because when he repented of a thing, he didn't go back to that thing. He truly repented. He turned away from and ran in the opposite direction and never returned to it. I think that God speaks of the end times and tells us the things that are to come for the simple fact that God does not want his children to be ignorant. You know, there are those that that will not know these things are coming, and, and they will be fearful of what they see. God in his goodness forewarned, and he has been doing so since, since the beginning of the prophetic age. He's forewarned his children of things that are to come so that they draw closer to God. You know, this is the time of preparation for the children of God to grow strong in him, to be determined in him, to know his will, to know his voice, so that when these things come, we may be ready, so that we will not fall by the wayside, so that we will not bend in the wind. Uh, God speaks concerning the future 
to prepare us in the present. That's the short answer. Yeah, definitely. Amen. So, all right. Um, and, yeah, I, I remember you saying something about, now, correct me if I'm wrong, you said something about going to war with another country um, before Bush's term was over. Is that... Okay. Uh, back in uh, the late, actually it was the early 90s, uh, my, my grandpa had a dream that uh, we would go to war with Iraq, and it wouldn't be one time, but it would be a second time. Uh, and, and for the last, you know, eight years, before the next Iraq war started, we got a lot of flack. And, oh, we never went back to war, but we did. Uh, I received uh, a dream wherein Bush's term, we would have two wars. I think that uh, it's, it's very close to coming together. Uh, the, the way I see it right now, and this is not thus says the Lord, but this is the way I see things playing out because of what I know God has shown me. Uh, I, I believe that Israel will, will have to go to war against Iran, and America will have to defend Israel, uh, and we will be drawn into this. I, I believe that a great shaking is coming upon all the earth, not just America, but the entire earth will suffer the ramifications of what is soon coming. So yes, I believe we are going to war again, and I believe it's going to be very soon. Uh, and I don't think that you know it's going to be as easy as the war we're currently in, because yeah. you know the war we're in right now that has spanned what three, four years. People said we were going to be out in a month, and even then I said, you know, God assured me we're going to be in this for longer than than any of us believe. And I got flack for that, too. But, but that's not a problem. I said what I needed to say, and, and if I'm wrong, then throw tomatoes at me, you know? But right. if I'm not, prepare your heart for the season when, you know, opulence will not be regarded as such a great thing anymore because uh, people will be weeping in the streets. Hmm. Wow. And, uh, I mean, and, of course, it, now that uh, I guess the Democrats have the House and the Senate, it... it Oh, that's, like that's, that's, that's another thing um, I, I, I told some friends about five months ago. Uh, <laughs> be, because I, I, I think it's leading up to, to 2008 that very few are predicting right now. Uh, and uh, it, it's a scary scenario for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like more improbable that, that we would go to war because of the, you know, the whole Democrats in Iraq. It's it, it it it's not either houses or congress's decision my friend. Uh yeah. this this uh, whether whether we go to war or not is, is on the shoulders of the president and uh, I I think you know he he may have many shortcomings but I I think he has uh, a certain glimpse and he sees the reality of uh of certain actions other nations are taking. And uh I I I believe wholeheartedly that we're going to be in it very soon. Wow. Okay. And uh, also, I guess on that note, then, you know, you talked about the, I, I believe you talked about the next president um, hating, uh, openly hating Christianity? No, I never said that. You never said that? I never said that. Okay. But, but odds are good. Okay. <laughs> and, but look, see, the, the way I look at it, honestly, we deserve to be ridiculed. I'm sorry. You know, I, I know that this is critical. Uh, and, and I know a lot of Christians are, are, you know, craning their necks right now. But because we're not living a life in Christ, and because we're hypocrites and we're duplicitous and we're as sinful as the rest of the world, because we're trying to pull one over on the world's eyes and say, look how righteous I am, and we're not living the life, we deserve to be ridiculed. We deserve for the world to stand there and point their finger and, and, and say, you're a liar. You know, I, I think, you know, recent events bring that out in glaring light. If you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. If you're going to be a child of God, then be so. Not just when you're in church Sunday morning, but live the life. Because then no man can point at you and say, hypocrite. They can persecute you, yes, but praise God. Uh, they, they can't call you a hypocrite, though. Yeah. I, I mean, it reminds me when, when Jesus, he said, you know, can you prove me guilty of sin to the Pharisees? And, and you know what? A lot of pastors are unwilling to ask that question because they know they have the bee in their bonnet, as the saying goes. Yeah, yeah. Uh. So, you know, this, this, this is what, you know, the, the whole idea that, you know, God accepts half measures ha has brought upon the Church. You know, God is still an either-or God. 
we we've just become uh, you know a, a duplicitous generation. You know, we serve a god of absolutes in a world of relativism, and relativism is so appealing right now that even the children of God are becoming rel- relativists. So, uh, yeah, it, it's a dangerous time. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, it definitely. It just seems like the only message, you know, that that we can preach is, you know, hate sin. At least for for the two of us here well, on but, the radio show. But God says, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it, it's mm-hmm. in Proverbs. Now, there's another verse in Proverbs that has been overlooked, which says, you know, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And so the beginning of your wisdom is to become the enemy of evil, is to hate evil. That is when wisdom begins. You know, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. If we fear the Lord, we're going to hate evil. Uh, We can't, you know, be enamored with evil and be tempted by it and still say that we fear the Lord in the same breath. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, praise God. And uh, I got another question from uh, Brandon. And All right. he says, uh, so in Revelation thirteen thirteen, there's, a, I guess, a false prophet um, on behalf of the beast is able to you know, do many supernatural phenomena, including calling down fire from the sky. And, you know, Christ in Matthew 24 speaks of false Christ and false prophets. So he says, you know, if we if demons can call down fire from the sky, then how can we tell which fire is of Christ or which is of the Antichrist? Jesus said, and, and it's 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 good to quote him because you know you can't get it wrong. Jesus said, "My sheep know my voice." All right, we are supposed to be founded on the Word of God. See, this is this is the problem with with a lot of people today is that they get distracted by shiny objects out in the desert. And over and over again, we've seen these movements that, that turned out not to be, you know, Christ, that turned out not to be true revival, that men flocked to, because it was something new and exciting, because it was something glamorous and entertaining. Look, God's sheep know His voice. And in order to know the voice of God, we can't just have an occasional experience with God. We have to have perpetual fellowship with Him. And knowing the voice of God, any time we hear something that's not of God, our spirit will tell us. You know, I, I've seen men, I've seen witches in, in Romania that, that can work works, but I know it's not of God because there's no fruit there. Hmm. Now, I've also seen men of God pray for someone and they're healed. I've also seen, you know, health being restored. I've seen miracles that I knew were of God because the men that were praying over the sick, the men that were doing what God told them to do, had the fruit of the Spirit, they had the fruit of righteousness, that has to accompany a true child of God. Yeah. So, so you're saying that that we should, we should be preaching with, you know, power with signs and with wonders as well? Oh, I believe so. I, I, I think we're a powerless generation because we refuse to acknowledge the fact uh, that God still works. You know, we've taken the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we've taken the whole book of Acts, and thrown it out the window because we say, well, if it's not happening with me, then it's not supposed to be anymore. But we don't realize that in order for God to fill us, we have to empty ourselves of ourselves. You know, God will not fill an old wineskin with new wine. We need to go through the rebirth process before God can pour His Spirit into us. And a lot of people aren't willing to do that. Look, we like, you know, giving God, you know, half the place of our heart and keeping the other half for vices and habits and sins that Christians really shouldn't have. Yeah. So I guess uh, also in the same... uh all right, and the next question, Brandon, he says, well, so is, v- is being able to see visions or dreams, is that a sign that one is truly in Christ? Or... Not... Look, not, not necessarily. Uh, how, oh, that, that's, a, that's a trick question, isn't it, Brandon? All right, let's... Uh, <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> yeah, it does. Look, a sign that one is in Christ is that they have been born again. That is the one sign that we know that the Bible speaks about. Now, the Bible also speaks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
which among them is dreams, visions, prophecy, speaking in tongues, discernment. There's even the gift of faith. So if we believe the Word of God, because it is the Word of God, then we believe that we have access to these gifts that God gives. Now, we know that someone is in Christ because they follow Christ, because they speak the name of Christ, and they believe that he is the only way, the truth, and the life. The devil will never point you to Jesus and say, repent, uh, because the devil's purpose is to deceive you into believing you're good enough to get into heaven when you haven't really repented. Uh, so, although that you know, the having of visions and dreams is not a sign that someone is, is saved or in Christ, as you put it. I believe that God gives gifts to his servants, among which are visions and dreams. Uh, and uh, these servants, few as they may be, have gone through the testing process. I know men who have gifts from God, and they've been persecuted, and they've been in prison, and they've been beaten, and they've been tortured, and they still did not did not deny the name of Christ. Look, you look at any other nation in the world, you look at China, or, or nations that, that still persecute Christianity, and you will see the true meaning of faith, and you will tre- see the true meaning of, of a Christian, where they will stand for their faith, even in the face of death. You know, right now, honestly, very few in this country are willing to die for the cause of Christ. And if you're not willing to die for him, then you're not willing to live for him either. Amen. Amen. And that's my answer, Brandon. <laughs> wow. Okay. And I guess he... I can't hear you again. Oh. Hello. 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 Are you there? Test. Test. I can hear you now. Okay. Praise God. I... It must be the phone. You there? I'm here. All right. <laughs> okay, so... We can hear you fine. We just... Okay. Yeah, we we can hear you whenever that happens. I'm not sure what happens. Yeah, but it's kind of difficult having a one-sided conversation, you know. <laughs> I do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so so I guess another question is like, okay, so if we find somebody, he uh, Brandon asked this, you know, but you know, I'm curious myself. It he says, you know, if someone is found out to be a false prophet, should we I guess follow or affiliate you know ourselves with such a person? No. Why, why would you? The Bible says, test the spirits to see if they're of God. No, we, we need to have a measure of individual accountability for the things that we believe or don't believe. You know, a lot of Christians today expect to be spoon-fed. They'll go and they'll listen and they'll receive anything the man at the pulpit says because they're too lazy to crack open the Word of God and find the truth for themselves. If someone is not speaking the Word of God, if someone is speaking a lie, then distance yourself from him. From such, turn away, the Bible says. You know, even though they may have nuggets of truth, you know, I, I hear this expression so many times that it, it, it irritates me now. Well, you know, you eat the meat and spit out the bones. The, the problem is that most false doctrines today are just fish. You know, there's more bones than meat, and eventually you're going to choke on something. So, you know, prove all things, the Bible says. Study the Word of God. See if what the person is saying correlates and corresponds with the Word of God. If you find that truth in the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So Brandon, that... Brandon likes to ask a lot of questions. That's a, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. I still can't hear you again. Hello? Hello? You there? Test? Uh, I can barely hear you, but not good enough to answer any questions. <laughs> I heard the word test. You, you there? Can you hear us this now? better? <laughs> you there? Okay, Hello? The phone. Uh, not really, no. <laughs> not really. Now right. I can. Okay, now you can. Yeah, whatever right. you're doing, keep doing that thing. <laughs> We're not doing anything. We're just readjusting the phone. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is not a top quality uh, area. I understand. Here. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So it seems like, um, and and then there's, it seems like there's the other, you know, there's always the the ones that just follow all the prophets, uh, you know, all the so-called prophets, in in churches, and you know, I've been to a lot of, you know, you know, Pentecostal type meetings, and you know, it's just here's another prophet saying this, saying this, saying this, you know. It, but then there's also the other spa- aspect where people have no idea, they've never even, 
especially, you know, a lot of the, you know, my friends that I've talked to, like, they don't even know, like, the gifts of the Spirit. They haven't even heard of that before. And, and that's tragic, and, and that's scary. Uh, and I, I think it's, it has largely to do, largely to do with, with the fact that we don't take the time to learn the most important thing of all, which is the Word of God. Look, I, I've been in meetings where they guaranteed a personal prophecy for every person that was there and all that other buckus. Uh, you know what? You can feel in your heart what is true and what is not. And I know people that, that, that follow so many voices, eventually they just give up. I, my, my personal advice to anyone is be sure that you're strong in God first. Look, the, the best prophetic source in the world bar none, is the Word of God. You know, over two-thirds of the Bible has to do with the end times, it has to do with prophecy. If you don't believe my words, if you don't believe the words of John, go to the words of Christ in Matthew 24 and see a picture of the future. You know, you don't, you don't have to follow men, but follow God with all of your heart. And then, you know, we, we pursue one thing w w with such fervor that we lose sight of God. We can't, you know, our intimacy with Christ, our relationship with Christ, has to be the number one thing on our agenda. It's not prophecy, it's not dreams, it's not visions, it's not knowing the future, it's our relationship with Christ. And if God chooses to, to, to give a gift, if God chooses to give a revelation, then, you know, it's my responsibility to put it out there. I don't charge for the, for the stuff I put on the website, it's there for anyone to look at, but... I would be disobedient to God if I didn't do my part, if I didn't fulfill my calling. But everyone's calling that wants to be a true child of God is to know God and know Christ intimately, to surrender their heart in totality to Him. Otherwise, what you know and what you think you know, irrelevant. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Okay, and then I guess one one other thing I was reading, you're, you know, you're, you, I guess in a lot of... Uh, sort of, you know, prophetic movements and stuff, there's, there's a, you know, practicing of, of prophecy, and you, you mentioned stuff about that before, but, you know, I guess the question is, you know, is there a difference between the gift of prophecy and then, you know, being able to practice it, and then, I guess, the, the office of a prophet, you know, as I, as I hear. Well, look, this is, this is the way I look at it. A bird was born with wings so that it could fly. If a person is endowed with the gift of prophecy, then God will show them how to prophesy. If I go to you and say, hey, I want to teach you how to fly, but you don't have any wings and we go up to the top of a building, odds are you're probably going to have a rough landing. You know, God chooses whom to use. You know, if we think we can teach prophecy or we can teach visions, you know, it's a falsehood. I do not believe that one can be taught. One has to be called into the office. One has to be called into the gift. All we can do is say, Lord, I'm ready. Use me. In whichever way you deem to use me, whether it be evangelism, whether it just be praying for my neighbor, whether it be just to be a good testimony to those around me. You know, a lot of people want to serve God, but they want the big jobs. They want the big offices. They want to be evangelists and prophets. Honestly and before God, when my grandfather died, I thought I was done. I could have a normal life. I could go back to school and pursue my archaeology degree, because that, that was my first love. Uh, and, and I thought I could, you know, have a nine-to-five job and live a normal life. And I fought God on the idea that, that I was supposed to go and preach to this nation, because I traveled with him for ten years prior to his death, and I was his translator, and I saw how people received him, and, and I saw the hardships he went through, and I saw the level of accountability he had to have before God. And I said, Lord, you know, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. I don't want to have to do anything with this. I'll go to church, I'll be a good Christian, but I'll be an average Christian. Now, my calling wasn't to pursue my archaeological degree, it was to go and preach, and God wouldn't let me be still until I went and fulfilled my calling. Every person has a calling in the kingdom of God. Not all will be prophets, not all will have visions, not all will have dreams, not all will be healers, not all will be preachers or evangelists, but each one's function is as important as the next. I don't believe that I'll get a bigger reward for going and preaching every Sunday than someone will for giving a glass of water to a thirsty homeless person. I believe the reward of God is equal for everyone, and that is eternity. And for me, hey, it's more than worth it. Amen. Amen. Um, I mean, what about, I, I, or I'm just curious, 
you say like equal. I mean, do you? Th I mean, do you think that's? What about like uh, I guess people who would be more obedient to God's calling or? Look, God. God offers eternity with Him. You know that 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 is the price that is paid. That is the reward that is given to all who are faithful. You know, there's a parable in the Bible about a man who was hiring folks. And, uh, you know, the first uh, crew came in early in the morning, the second came in about noonday, and, and the third came in just a little before, you know, dusk, when they were supposed to shut down operations. And when the man went out and paid, he paid everyone equally, the Bible says. And some of them who had been there since early morning look at those that had been there for, you know, 10, 15 minutes and go, you know, that's not fair. But see, it's, it's not up to me to say what's fair. God is God, and He is just. And all I care about is being with Him in eternity. Anything else, you know, wh whether someone receives a special reward for dying the death of a martyr, or, or, or someone receives a, a special reward for, for being more faithful, that's, that's between God and God. You know, all I'm concerned about is that I work out my salvation with fear and trembling daily, that I may see Him, stand before Him, and hear the words, Well done. Yeah, amen, amen, and, uh, you know, the alternative isn't, certainly isn't very fun. <laughs> it's not, and, and, and the alternative is as real as heaven is. You know, that's, that's what a lot of Christians don't seem to understand, you know, and, and it's not, you know, a party, and it's not something that you're going to be enjoying, because I, I've heard this uh, saying, well, the funnest people get to go to hell, apparently, and I'm going to be having fun there. Oh, okay. Believe me, if, if the Word of God is true, which we know it is, hell is not going to be a fun place. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, okay, um, and then I'm also just curious about, when you say you, you saw some, uh, what, what witches did, I'm just curious, what, what did you see? Oh, uh, the divination, they were reading palms, they were telling people their names, uh, the, the year they were born. I, I, I saw a gypsy witch in my country levitate, you know, wow. but I knew the source of her power, and I yeah. knew it wasn't God. You know, always look at the source of any man. Always look, you know, where it springs from, and you will know the heart of the man. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, okay, so... And then I'm also, you know, curious, you know, sometimes, you know, I, you know, I walk into, you know, Dunkin' Donuts or whatever, you know, and there's like a blind man there. And I'm just thinking, okay, God, you know, I really, really want to pray for him. But then, like, you know, I walk out and nothing happens. Do, do, I mean, do you ever, like, walk into the grocery store and, you know, you're just like, you know, let's pray. And then you go for it. <laughs> when you pray for someone's healing, yeah. you have to know that it's God telling you. All right. I, I have prayed for healing in, in, in my entire life in ministry, which is, you know, by myself, it's coming on 10 years now, and with my grandfather, 20, uh, I, I've prayed for maybe two dozen people to be healed. But when I prayed for them, I knew that God w was compelling me. I knew He was moving me to pray for them, and, and, and they saw restoration, and they saw healing. You know, uh, we, sometimes, you know, uh, how do I put it? Uh, you know, we don't listen for the voice of God, and so, you know, we take it upon ourselves to do God's job for Him. You know, when God has something specific for us, like praying for a blind person to be healed, you know, God will move on us. We will know that it's the voice of God, and it will be for His glory. Right. And, you know, I guess obviously that comes with, you know, walking in, in holiness and in fear of God. Of course. there There is no other way. And, and there are some... You know, there, there are certain times when you pray and nothing happens, and the apostles went through something like that, and they came to Christ, and, and, and they were befuddled. They go, Lord, you know, we prayed, and, and nothing happened. And Christ turns to them and said, such a one only comes out by fasting and prayer. You know, there, there are certain issues that are harder to deal with than others, and we need to be prayed up and fasted up and read up, and, and we need to know that we're walking with God, that we are in His will, that, that we have the authority to lay hands on a person, and that person will be restored. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I mean, you, you talk about Peter and John knowing, knowing what power that they had. Oh, they were certain of it. Yeah. Because they knew what they received from Christ. Yeah, definitely. Um... 
Yeah, okay, and then I guess another, one more question, or, well, not one more, but a few more. Uh, <laughs> that's all right with you. Um, Fine. Yeah, I remember your grandfather talking about visiting the Mormons in Utah. and Yes, that was an experience. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear it. I didn't hear, you know, all of it, and I'm just curious, what was the story? What, you were there, right? I was. I was his translator at the time. Uh, the story was, is that in the Book of Mormon, there is a prophet that comes from another nation, preaches repentance, and then goes back to his nation. Now, a, a lot of the Mormon people believed my grandfather to be that man. And so they set up an extensive tour for him, and my grandfather... Uh, you know, was a very cut-and-dry person. If, if I would have to, you know, associate him with anyone in the Bible, I, I think it would be Paul. You know, he didn't mince words. He just said what he needed to say, and he got off the stage. And uh, we went, and my grandfather preached the truth. And as a consequence, uh, we had thousands of people write in letters saying, you know, I just left the Mormon Church. You know, how do I draw close to God? How do I receive the Holy Spirit? And so there was a reason for our going there, and there was a reason for doing the tour, and it was to show people the light of the truth. Yeah. Um, you said something about when, or he said something about when he was preaching that, you know, he just said that, you know, the Book of Mormon is, is not the truth. It is not the gospel of Christ, yes. Yeah. And, and and at that point, they saw an angel coming down behind me and my grandfather, and, and so they remained glued to their seats. Uh, and, and this was something that, that the crowd saw. We had no idea. Grandpa just kept preaching. And, and I was scared out of my wit, uh, because, you know, we were in Provo, Utah. It was the heart of Mormonism. Yeah. You know, I thought we were going to just get killed and dropped off in the desert somewhere, and nobody would be the wiser. Uh, and, and I'm like, oh, God, just if I live through this, please. <laughs> and, uh, you know, hey, there have been moments. I, I can't say, you know, the, the, there haven't been moments when, 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 when he'd say something and do something that I'm like, oh, we're going to get in trouble. You know, but I did my duty. I translated for the man, and it, it was always right on. And, you know, it, that's not what I respected him out of most either. It was the fact that he was always the same. You know, as humble at home as he was behind the pulpit. You know, Grandpa was Grandpa. And, uh, you know, he, he hated glory, and he loved humility, and he would do anything for God. Yeah. Yeah, amen, amen. And uh, so I also noticed that on your website um, you haven't, er, there hasn't been a, a message recently. There hasn't been a, a prophecy recently. Um. I guess the last one was about an earthquake. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I've had a few dreams that I'm um, unwilling to post, uh, and, and I haven't made public, because I'm, I'm not a fear monger, all right? I, I, I release what, what I feel is necessary to be released so that people get their hearts right with God. Yeah. Uh, I've had a few dreams uh, this year that, that I, I've written down and I've put in my you know desk drawer and locked it up because it was something that when I see happening will be confirmation to me. Uh, and and, and it's, not, it's not a good thing, you know, and it's not a positive thing. And it's something that has been, you know, relayed in, in different ways, but before. So I, you know, when, when I feel that God gives me something that I need to make public, I do. Uh, I'm not one of those people that says, you know, I have a revelation every five minutes, and if God chose never to show me anything again, I'd be fine with that. You know, I, I, I'm not one of those people that, that needs to have revelation, and I'm not one of those people that profiteers from, from, from messages from God so that he makes stuff up uh, in order to induce people to send money. So, you know, it is what it is. If God gives something, I, I pass it along. If not, I'm silent. Yeah. Uh, amen, I guess. Yeah, that's certainly... I, I definitely agree. I agree that that... And once again, we don't hear each other. All right. Test. You there? You there? Hello? 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 Do what you did before. It seemed to work. All right. You there? I, I can't hear you, bud. No. No now? Test? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> no dice. Hello? No. I hear you now. You hear me now? Yeah. Okay. 
right. Yeah. All right. Um. All right. So. All right. Praise God. So I guess one other thing I was going to ask you about is: is there any, is there any message? You know, an, an urgent message on your heart right now. You know, what what's the last thing that God has told you that you are willing? I guess that you would reveal that you would say. Uh, the most urgent message on my heart is what was on John the Baptist's heart, you know, some 2,000 years ago. It's repent for the kingdom of God is nigh. I, I think that any preacher who says this is not the most urgent message has missed the boat. You know, right now, repentance within God's own house is the most urgent message of all. Because if we are to stand in the days that are coming, we need to be wholly consecrated unto God today. We need to purpose in our hearts that we will not defile ourselves, that we will not bend, that we will not break, and that we will not deny. And so this is the season of preparation for what is coming. And what is coming, you know, will be evident to all very shortly. And it's something that, that will shake uh, a lot of people from their slumber. Right, right. And, I, you know, I guess, you know, you, you always quote, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Can you hear me? Do what you did again. I can't hear you. Okay, hello? Hello? I can't hear you. <laughs> hello? You there? I hear a voice in the background, but no, not clearly enough. Hello? Can you hear me? Hit him on. Can you hear me now? Hello? 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 Faulty equipment. Faulty equipment. Mic's on? Mic's off. Hello? You there? Uh, I can barely, barely hear you. Yes, I'm here. You can barely hear me. All right. Um, yeah, I can hear you well now. You can hear me well now. Oh, yeah. man. Our faulty equipment. We're going to have to pray for, pray for some new equipment. <laughs> here. Um, all right. Great. And I, you know... You know, one thing I wonder, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, I, I wonder, you know, do you have a, d does God give you spiritual discernment? And, you know, when you walk in a place, you know, it, is it just obvious to you that who who is in sin and who, you know, who is kind of, you know, just... Well, I, I think I, I see it based on the reaction to the message uh, more than anything else. And there are times when God you know, gives me uh, specific things for specific people. And uh, I I'm not as, as, as brazen as my grandfather. I don't point them out during the service. But after I'm done preaching, I go to them and I said, look, God's showing me you're in this sin and you need to repent. Uh, but uh, look, you, you can feel those who are like-minded. You can feel those who have the Spirit of Christ and those who don't. Uh, and yeah, in, in, in large part, uh, you know who are of the house and who are from without. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you know, I remember you talked sometime, and you said something about uh, you know what there was. Can you just tell us the the, the story when you were you were, you went up to preach, and then you know some guy in the front row was. You said he was in uh, adultery. I think it was. Yeah, it, that was my grandpa. Oh, your grandpa said that. Yeah, we were in a church in Colorado. See, he used to do it during service, and. You know, it, it, it was, um, you know, uh, it was a lot of uh, heartburn because he used to do it during service. Because, I mean, he he just stopped in the middle of a sermon. We were in Colorado in a church. Wow. And, you know, everything was going along, and uh, he looks up. It was the front view. It was the pastor, actually. Oh. And, and he says, you know, you need to stop committing adultery with your secretary. Oh. Uh, and the pastor runs out of the church, and the woman start, you know, starts to cry. His secretary, she was like back four or five pews. Wow. Uh, and the guy never came back. We, we shut down the service, basically. We, we did the ending prayer, and we, we went home. And, uh, yeah, that, that was a very interesting uh, experience. <laughs> wow, that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty intense, you know? Uh, wow. I, I was 13 years old uh, at the time, mind you. So, you know, mo most of the time, until I was about 15, I, I got a little growth spurt, but I'd have to stand on a chair behind the pulpit for people to see me. <laughs> and people people weren't looking at my grandpa. You know, he was speaking Romanian. They, they were looking at me. And, and I, I'd look at him, and I'd go, come on, don't make me say this. Yeah. You know, he'd say it. Well, okay. 
Uh, yeah, it wasn't, you know, a lot of people think it was really exciting, but sometimes it, it was really heart churning. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, d- I, did that happen a lot with with uh, with your grandfather? Not to that extent. I in 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 a lot of services, he he'd point people out and say, "Yeah, you need to stop smoking. You need to stop beating your wife." He'd just go just just machine gun, you know. And all of them would just <gasps> you know. And, uh, it, it, it's like they were doing something naughty in the dark, and somebody turned on the light. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess you know another thing that we talk about here on the show is. Is kind of. Uh, I cannot hear you. You there? <laughs> Test. Test. Hello. 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 Yeah, I think it's on timer or something. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Michael? Hello? Hello? Test? Test? I, I can hear you now. Yeah. It seems like it's some some weird interval. All right. Uh-huh. Um, what was the last thing I asked you? Uh, the last thing you asked me was about an experience with my grandpa in the church. Uh, where he pointed someone else, uh, someone yeah. out, someone out about adultery. Yeah, and and so we're talking about you know iron sharpens iron, and you know, you know when do you think you know if if we know about another brother's sin, you know, what do we do? You know, do we? I, well, I, the, <laughs> the Bible is very specific. You go to that brother, you know, and and you urge him to repent. If if he doesn't repent. Uh, you go to the church elders, you know, but the church elders should have enough discernment to know if there's sin in the church. Yeah. Look, there, there's no deception as bad as self-deception. This is, this is something that we need to get, get, get through and, and let it sink to our hearts. You know, I, I would rather just walk away than deceive myself for years thinking that I'm right, but, but knowing that I'm not. You know, don't don't deceive yourself. If you know there's something wrong, that's why a pastor's there, that's why the church is there. You know, a lot of people are embarrassed to go and, and, and confess. You're not confessing to men, you're confessing to God. And the Bible says in James, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. You know, we're the body of Christ, we're the family of God. We need to begin to trust each other and, and be dependent upon each other and, and, you know, pray for each other and lean on each other. Because this, this walk sometimes gets treacherous, and it's difficult, and the path is narrow, and there's stumbling blocks, but it, when you have a brother by your side and you're able to share, somehow it makes it just a little bit easier. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, you know, that's just something we deal with, uh, you know, all the time, uh, seeing, you know, seeing sin and, you know, what to do about it. And it some... would seem uh, we have happened upon another interval of silence. Oh, really? Oh, here you go. Okay. In my back. I can all right. you know. Okay, and um, also uh, just about the you know America you know falling, and uh, about kind of the the tribulation. What what is the correlation between the fall of America, the fall of Babylon? I I, I believe that it's one and the same thing. Uh, I also believe that we have a false expectation of being raptured out before any of these things happen. Uh, and I've been in churches where I've heard pastors say that. Uh, well, we should have been gone by now. You know, that's scary to me. You read Matthew chapter 24, which I believe is the greatest prophecy ever uttered, and it wasn't uttered by a man so that we can poke holes in it. It was uttered by the Son of God. And if you're not going to believe the words of Christ, then I'm sorry, you're not going to believe anything coming out of my mouth either. Uh, you read Matthew 24, and it gives you the timetable, and it tells you that after all these things, after wars and rumors of wars, after earthquakes and pestilence, uh, after all these things... Finally, the dawning of the day, the coming of the Christ. So, you know, we've got a lot of ground to cover before we see the, the return of Christ, and we need to prepare our hearts for, for, you know, standing for our faith, for answering for what we believe in, and knowing what we believe in. You know, a lot of people are Christians, and they don't even know what they believe in. Um, and and there, there, there's a lot of things that could be said, but it is what it is. We, we go to the individual, and um, right now it's, you know, faith is not a collective issue. It's an individual thing. The soul that sins shall die. And so, you know, we work out our own individual salvation, and we cling to Christ because 
there's nothing else worth clinging to. Right, right. And uh, all right, well then, um, I guess uh, I guess we should close out in prayer. Um, I guess first of all, uh, what do you think the direction of just this this radio show should be for you know for this college? Well, the name of it, if I'm not mistaken, is what the Jesus Show. The Jesus Radio Show. Yeah, the it's Jesus Radio Show. Well, then, is the then, first Christian the, one. Then, then let your direction be Jesus. <laughs> uh, you can't go wrong, man. Point to Christ, uh, because if you don't find satisfaction in Jesus, you're not going to find satisfaction in anything else. You know, uh, meditation mantras or, or any a- anything else that you can think of. If you don't find your satisfaction in Christ you won't find it anywhere. Amen. Amen. Um, all right, uh, Mike, would you mind uh, just closing us out in prayer? No, I would not. All right. Uh, we come before you, dear Heavenly Father, and we ask you to grant us wisdom, uh, grant us boldness and courage to proclaim your name, open our hearts that we may understand your truth, and give us wisdom that we may walk in the light of your ways. We ask you to strengthen and lead. We ask you to guide us and pick us up when we stumble. We ask you to be with us and make us living testimonies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Mike. Well, then, uh, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate welcome. your time. Not a problem. And uh, I'll try to send you this Send you this uh, tape. All right. God bless. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> wow. How about that? How All about right. that? So... Are we on? We're I we're on. I can't hear myself in the phones. Hello. <laughs> I I don't really think it matters. Well, that was pretty cool. Wow. So I I've been talking quite a lot, Phil. <laughs> <Would you> like <laughs> <to> no, it's <laughs> all right. I don't have much to say. I just wanted you to say it when he, when he hung up. I just wanted you to say Pache. <laughs> oh, <laughs> said, <laughs> dog, my bad. That's all right. You're right. Oh, mm. well, I guess when Mike gets this, then he'll hear it. Yeah, Pache, Mike. <laughs> Pache, Mike. <laughs> Like you know, oh, wow. I, I wish we had like two ways to to ask questions, like I mean, or two receivers so we could have talked inside. Yeah, yeah I wasn't out. sure if you, if the mics were plugged in, that he could hear the right. relay. That's cool. I thought though. for a second he could hear you speaking. Well, maybe I was just talking loud enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's sad. Well, you know. All right. Uh, well. There we go. Wow. All right. So you know, I pray God. I pray that you guys would. Would really, would really, um, uh, open your ears, you know, open your ears. It, it, time, time is urgent, and you know, why go, why go another minute without, without Christ, without knowing that you're in, without knowing that you're in Christ. And I like, I like what he had to say about um, when you mentioned the iron sharpens iron passage, and. Uh, and he said, uh, basically, we are, we are the body of Christ, and uh, and we should start acting like it, and uh, <laughs> like we should be helping each other when we stumble, yeah. and praying for one another, and confessing and encouraging one another. And I think that's uh, that's very important. And uh, I thank God for Jim because, like, he's been he's been there for me this semester. Even though he just rolled his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, to God but, be the uh, glory. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, praise God. So. Wow, well, we've had like a, an hour and. We got yeah, we got we got juice, minutes. man. We got some juicy time. <laughs> praise God, praise yeah. God. Is I wonder if anyone's waiting outside or anything. Um, Should I go check? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, so. <laughs> anyway. Uh, it, it's it's very humbling to to talk to Mike. Uh, you know, I thank God that that he allowed uh, you know did he allowed Mike to to be able to come. And you know, I really pray that you you'd really just uh, you know it seems like his message is always the same. You know, just just turn from your sins, just turn from your sins. Um, wow, praise God. So. Wow, what can we do except wrap up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's about 7 o'clock. Oh, we didn't read the FCC warning. We didn't read the FCC warning. I don't know, is it too far gone for that? Yeah, I think it's too far gone. 
Um, we'll just apologize. Sorry, UMBC, for neglecting. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. one thing about, I guess, confessing our sins is, you know, he said when you're confessing your sins, um, you're not confessing to man, you're confessing to God. And there's really nothing to be ashamed of. You know, and, and we talked about it last week. What happens? What's the moral of the Ted Haggard story? And I really believe the moral is don't hide sin. Don't live in hidden sin. Confess it right away as soon as possible. And uh, to God be the glory. All right, guys. I guess we're going to head out, and we'll be back to, um, you know, the name of our show. Or like Mike said, the Jesus Radio Show. <laughs> we're going to be back to preach Christ and Him crucified. And, uh, you know, if you have any prayer requests or you want to confess your sin live to, to the glory of God, um, give us a call, uh, 455-2656. And... Oh, yeah, and one more thing. Uh, If you're in the comments, look up at the TV screen. The LCD monitor. The LCDs. And check it out. By the info desk. By the info desk. And, uh, yeah, you'll see. You'll see. Praise God. And, yeah. So let's let's just start being being Christians now. I'm up for it. Let's die. (laughs) Let's do it. Calling all Christians on the UMBC campus.